Community Workshop of the Borough of Mechanicsburg uh, Council on February 2nd, 2021 to order. This is the meeting of the Standing Committees of Borough Council. The first item of business on the agenda is the approval of the committee minutes from the January 5th, 2021 meeting. Uh, can I entertain someone to entertain a motion there? I'll make that motion. All right, that was Mr. Pellman and a second. I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Booker. Is there any uh, discussion? Hearing none, um, let's see, Sarah, Sarah was here. Sarah Martin, there you are. Sarah, we'll let you handle the response. I will record the vote as unanimous. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, hearing no negative response, the motion carries. So the minutes are approved. All right, we're going to begin with um, municipal and community outreach, and we'll uh, send that over to Mrs. Agerton. So we have a meeting scheduled on the 23rd um, following the community and economic development meeting. Um, we're, we're shooting for 6.30 to 7. Okay, very we'll good. We'll need to advertise that. All right, you got that, Mr. Szerski? All right, very good. Anything else? That is it to report this evening. All right, thank you. Any questions for Mrs. Agerton? Hearing none, we move on to community and economic development. Mr. Miller. Okay, so following up on that scheduled meeting, um, we are having the, we are scheduled to meet or we are going to schedule to meet on uh, the 23rd of February at 6 p.m. Um, for the Community and Economic Development Committee. I checked with Ms. Yerick and she's available. Uh, Mr. Anthony is available and uh, Ms. Agerton is available. So we're all on. Oh, we lost all, We're all on the same committee. So we figured it'd be uh, convenient to lump that all into. Very one good. Um, I don't have anything else to report other than uh, that would be It'd be great if we could have an update by that time on the progress with the um, comprehensive plan. Roger, if you want to ping them and uh, let them know that we have a meeting. All right. I, yes, I did. I have a scheduled set. I have a scheduled meeting set up for them uh, for Carolyn tomorrow. Uh, they're going to get a, a um, package together. Uh, we're going to go over what is there, what we see as the issues. And then they're going to present this. They'll make a package together for council, and we can get it um, both of those meetings on the twenty third. So we can we can mit, hit those both those meetings. Yep. All right. We'll have something to present. All right, that's great. And so that's that's all I have to report now for for community and economic development. All right, and those meetings will be Zoom meetings, I presume. Correct. Okay. And uh, will the rest of us be able to? have access to that Zoom if we want to attend? Yeah, of course. Okay, perfect, perfect. Any questions for Mr. Miller? Uh, hearing none, we'll move on to uh, finance administration and ordinance, Mr. Anthony. Thank you very much. So according to the agenda, we are discussing an update to the borough personnel policy. Correct. So uh, <clears throat> I guess I'll start with, um, has everybody had an opportunity to review the borough personnel um, policy changes that was sent out by the borough manager? I have three screens going and I can't see people nodding heads. So I'm gonna assume that everybody has unless they haven't, but if they haven't just uh, kind of holler uh, does anybody have any thoughts or concerns? Uh, would you like to go through it page by page, or would you like to talk about things you have concerns about? Right, hearing none, uh, I have a couple of quick questions. First is, um, looking for it now on the policy. Uh, John, I'll let you go first. I do have a, a point on the anti-nepotism ordinance or the anti-nepotism policy that was crafted from the ordinance. 
So I'll just, I'll let you go with the points you have and then we'll talk about that. All right. All right, very good. Um, so one of my questions was, was tied to that, Kyle. So I will skip over that question and go to, uh, first of all, I guess my question is, Roger, can you tell me, were you, did you make the changes and then we had Mike review that or did Mike make changes based on what you asked him to do? How did that, how did this work? Mike's made, Mike has, Mike and his staff have reviewed this thing probably three times since we started talking about this. Um, a lot of the comments that came from Renee in his office have already been incorporated into here for legal review. What we were looking for, and I, because I wanted to set, I was looking to try to save a little bit of time and money and have him do the legal review first and have the comments made um, from the council and the committee. And then he could do one last, we can make the changes, he can do one last review and then get it over to council. I, would, I was figuring on giving him a red line version like the original one I sent out to everyone uh, so that he knew where to go. He didn't have to review the entire document all over again. Right, right, right. Good, good. Okay. So on page seven where it says uh, ap uh, applicability, uh, this sounds like a circular sentence to me. So I'm just curious. It says the policy does not apply to employees and their relatives who are already uh, employed by the borough as of the effective date of the policy. And then it says this policy shall be applied however, to all potential future hirings, potential promotions, transfers, assignments, or reassignments of relatives of current employees. So it says it's not going to be applied to current employees. It is going to be applied to current employees. Sounds like it needs to maybe add a word to the, that line, that top line there. It says maybe that somehow it's this, not going to be applied. Yeah. Yeah, this was actually in the, in the original email I sent out. We had, I told, said we had a, a, a problem in this, this section here. This was taken right out of um, the original anti-nepotism ordinance, the way it was. Right. The, and Mike and uh, Renee at Mike's office actually are the ones that pointed out this was, this was a, it was kind of the applicability, but it's unapplicable. So, you know, what do we drop here to, to make this thing enforceable? That's what uh, I have it highlighted on the copies that I sent out to you guys um for your review and that's that's what i was getting at on this point um in the actual purpose this policy will not derive any permanent employee will not deprive any permanent employee as of date of adoption of this policy any promotional right in the normal career development nor change the existing status of any permanent employee it contradicts with the, the applicability clause well so long as that person is not going to be supervised by a relative right but with that's where they they may already be. That's the you know they may, may already be right. That's correct. We want to keep and allow to continue under a grandfathering kind of clause, but we but we still want to keep in that part where they would be any changes in their employment would this new policy would apply to. And I'm correct. just asking the attorney to maybe craft that differently. All right. Now I will be honest with that, you, Mike. Yeah. Mr. Cassidy has not looked at this okay. if i'm not mistaken i think i sent him on december the 23rd or 24th when i sent this out to council i think that's the first that i sent it to mr cassidy mm -hmm. the mic i've been referring to is mike miller yeah me too i assume i don't i don't ever assume that we need to have two attorneys look at anything i would assume that okay but i, I, I just i wanted to clarify that though i didn't i so <laughs> thank you. And that is that is correct. I am deferring to Mike Miller and Eckerd Siemens with respect to the review of this. I don't see any need to duplicate effort. Right. Uh, but if there are any questions that you'd like to run by me, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. But but my understanding is, is that the the anti nepotism provisions are intended to uh, more or less maintain the status quo with respect to any um, uh, uh, family relationships that that may currently exist um, within um, your staff, but any changes to uh, the employment status of any of those employees, this anti-nepotism policy would apply. But that, that's my understanding. But again, I defer those questions really to Mike Miller and his staff. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, page 19 is just a comment. Page 19 at the top where it says uh, all complaints submitted to the borough account uh, all complaints submitted to Burke Council must be timely. 
upon receipt of a complaint, the council shall immediately assign the personnel committee to investigate. So in my time on council, which I think is like six years now, I've not seen anything come through the personnel committee that I'm aware of. So we've had no complaints because it looks like we took a policy, a part of this policy and just recrafted the wording of it because it was, it was stricken. I love the colors, by the way, purple, bigger font, love that. Uh, red, smaller font, not as much, but the, the different, uh, the separate. So it looks like we recrafted it to be more appropriate. Um, it's just a comment, but it feels like we haven't had any com employee complaints that this is the case, if we've been following policy. Um, no, we've been, if, we've, if we'd handled under under executive session, if there would have been. So the, only, the, last, the last one we had, the personnel policy handled, and it never went any further than the personnel committee. Got it. Oh, so it did go to personnel? It did, yeah, it went to the personnel committee. Gotcha. Uh, page 21. That's why I'm not following you. I've got, I need the yeah. red line copy open. Hold on a second. Yeah, I'm utilizing the red line copy. That's what yeah, that's why I couldn't find what you were talking about on page 19. <laughs> I, this is a curiosity, and it, it might, maybe the attorney can answer this, I don't know, but, um, uh, and actually I experienced this in my own life. So uh, our insurance provider, we will, under our policy, provide insurance uh, subject to whatever amount is due to be paid by the employee to, or, or to uh, a relative or a spouse, I guess, or a family of uh, an employee, as it says it in here. Uh, as so long as they don't have other insurance available to them, how often do we go back and check that? I mean, is there a, a you're proving a negative. So are we having them sign something every year that says, I don't have available, my, my spouse doesn't have available insurance. And so they're going to be on my policy. Yes, we send out a spousal declaration every November. Perfect. To every you. employer. Yeah, um, that was provided by Mike Miller's office. We did not draft that in house. It was well, provided true. by labor attorney. Yeah. And you, you are right. We're trying to prove a negative there. Yeah, uh, I'm just looking for an affidavit from them annually so that yep. we have them on record is all. So, so you're uh, in, uh, suggesting that it should be like in clear verbiage in there. Is that what you're saying? That, 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 they, that the affidavit should be submitted every year. Like, should that be covered in the personnel policy? That's actually covered under the Affordable Care Act. Okay. I'll have to go look at that. Um, and then the last thing that I think I have for this, besides what I think, uh, I'll see if Kyle's going to hit the same thing. Uh, Council Miller's going to hit the same thing I was going to think about. But on page 25, I was looking at the, I just had a question as to why we eliminated number four. And Roger, I don't know if you covered that with, with uh, Attorney Miller or not. But uh, that, that is where that, that's where that strikeout came from. Yes. That was his suggestion to take it out of there. He did not give me any reason why they came back from them with that section struck out. I would assume, and this is, this is an assuming, uh, the FLML, FMLA act changed for some reason and the verbiage changed because that was one of the reasons why we sent it over to him because he has people over there that are very, very familiar with the FMLA act mm -hmm. and they I think that's where this came from is that came out of that, that change there. Yeah. So it's strike, it's written and stricken twice. I would ask him only to maybe give us a couple of words as to why he strikes things out when he strikes them out. If it's just, Hey, we're striking this because the law changed. That's cool. But uh, I read it like four times trying to figure out where it was replaced or what was going on. It'd be a lot easier just for us to. Which, like, you're talking about number four. Yeah. Like change okay. notes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Councilman Miller, I think that was all I had for right now. Uh, you had something else? Uh, mine? Yes, mine was. Um, let me try to find the page here. It's page seven if you're following. And it's um, basically trying to reconcile the ordinance, which was um, drafted and this copy that was inserted and it states that 
Uh, the, in the purpose, the provisions of this policy outlines the permitted hiring practices with respect to relatives of municipal employees or elected or appointed officials, defines the meaning of relative and provides for restrictions of application of the policy. The problem is it does not do that. The ordinance did, but the policy does not. Right. Because the definition section was removed. So it's... I, I'd be interested in um, to hear whether or not from Mike, well, either Mike, I'm not sure, whether, um, whether or not we need a definition section or whether we just strike that from the purpose. What, what, are we on here? Wouldn't we almost need a definition because then like, how is it enforceable if there's no definition of what a relative is? But well, becomes quite broad because then it's basically every blood uh, relative, which is late, is mentioned later. Um, blood so marriage or adoption. I mean, they're all. Correct. It yeah. covers all of those. It covers all of those. It becomes quite broad, whereas the one that was in the ordinance was a narrower definition. So, I would suggest defining that term in the policy. So we should we should look at adding that back in, Roger. That definition. Okay. I'm not sure uh, what my suggestion would be on the conflict there with the uh, purpose section and the applicability. I know that the applicability section is typical in an ordinance. Um, and the reason it was done was like uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Cassidy said, was to maintain the status quo and that an ordinance can be applied to all potential fewer future hiring and promotion transfer. So I'm not sure how much authority the personnel policy has over potential future hiring, being that those uh, candidates are, are not technically employees yet of the borough, but I could see it applying to promotion transfer, you know, assignment or reassignment of relatives, um, just as so long as they're not managed by um, their blood relative, which maybe that is where the edit to the clause comes in at that, at the end uh, to clarify. Yeah, my interpretation of that was that you know, to your point, Kyle, was that it's a guide for future employees to know that when they become an employee that they, they will be having to follow these policies. Uh, so that's why I think. Well, to that, to, to that point, although I, you know, to any job that I've applied to, I've never received a personnel policy at my interview, um, which is why I advocated for the ordinance. But in right. order to fix this, uh, I, I'm really not sure what the best course of action is. So, well, could it be covered as like um, uh, somebody that currently is employed? Like, cover it on the end of our current employees rather than the people applying. Whereas, like um, the, the hiring professionals that are making the decision are not are like restricted from hiring people that they're related to. Like, w w whereas we can actually like where the personnel policy would cover them, but not the people that are applying. That makes sense. That does make sense. Yeah, maybe it could be worded differently to address that. Yeah, I would agree with that. Does that make sense, Roger? Yes, it does. Um, so basically it's, it would be uh, all right. I, I know the gist here. I'm. I'll have Mike. I'll send something over to Mike. Tell him what it is that we're looking for. Then before we go too much further down the road, as soon as he gets back to me, I'll send it out to you, and you guys can go over it. At least the, the personnel committee can, or the the ordinance administration committee can go over it. See if that's the intent that you're looking for, and then I'll add it into the policy. I just want to make sure we capture your intent there. Completely. So it's basically 
um, anybody that's doing the hiring, the, you want this section direct with the applicability section directed toward anybody doing the hiring. Well, we want it to, to match with the, um, the other, the uh, purpose section. Mm -hmm. And we want it to clarify uh, the applicability that the, it's, it can be applied to those hiring those doing the hiring versus future versus those future employees, because they're not, in this case, they're not the decision makers and they're not, uh, they're not technically under the personnel policy yet. Correct. So we'd have to make that state that the department heads, because even though the hiring, you know, Glenda and I would be doing most of the hiring. You want that to mean that, we don't, we don't want to hire Curtis's daughter to work at the sewer plant with is basically what it amounts to. Because we would be doing the hiring the same way with the codes official. Um, now, the codes the official answers directly to me. I would be managing him but or her in that case. But if we were to hire somebody for the highway garage, we want to make sure that he's not related to CH or Scott, who is the foreman at the, at the highway garage. I would just say let's have Mike just... Tell Mike our concerns okay. and then right. let him let uh, see what he suggests as far as what the, the best wording is for that. Okay. All right, folks, is there anything else that we need to talk about relative to the personnel policy update? All right, hearing none. Thank you, Roger. Number two is a discussion on return to regular meeting schedule and office hours for the borough. I, I was, was hoping where we weren't on regular scheduled meetings. So can you hit me with what you mean by that? <laughs> in person, I believe is in what- In person, I believe. Yeah, is what that's mean. what the intent was there. Um, this was one of those, those sections that was written and Glenda and I were in passing. So um, the, Getting back to a regular virtual or not a, a non-virtual in-person meeting. And uh, this is kind of where I wish Nate was on uh, to discuss what his outlook looks like going forward. Um, but with the COVID being the way it is, we've been running the office as by appointment only. Um, people, there's a doorbell out front. They can come up. They can ring the doorbell if they, they really need to get, you know, to see something. Um we have not had a lot of people set appointments um, and the same way with deliveries and stuff like that. So that's what we were kind of, where do we want to go to the point that we want to open the office back up? Um, personally, I feel that the numbers are still relatively high that I think we should be by appointment only here. However, I think we could have, we had a planning commission meeting the other night in person um, and there were, there wasn't, there was one extra, one person in the audience. Um, and in situations like that, we've been asking them to, like it was just for the school district. We asked them to limit the amount of people they brought to the planning commission meeting. And uh, Scott, you were there, you saw what, what that looked like. We were all spread out around a table. Now, if we were to go back to an in-person meeting and we're still under some kind of COVID restrictions, I think there's certain people that we would ask to either sit in the audience or not attend to keep the staff numbers down. Um, some of those would be per perhaps, you know, um, Chief Myers, Chief Neff, uh, Engineer Rogalski only if he was needed, um, which would probably really upset him. But, um, you know, there's a, there's a few that we could, we could have there, but we wouldn't really need them there unless we had an absolute question. So that way we, we would open it up for more participation from the from the public if they wanted to be there my I a, go ahead let's let sarah talk uh, first yep. so from my healthcare perspective you know I, I love to be the doom and gloom but we have a new strain that's more contagious and my thought is is do we not feel that these zoom meetings are eliciting participation I, sometimes i think we may even have more participation from the community on our zoom meetings if we would move to in-person in the future, could we do a hybrid model so that we could still have participation um, from these members and, and be able to have it? Because what I don't wanna do 
is move to a meeting where we limit the amount of people that want to participate because of this, the fear of spread. We still are not, I mean, we are nowhere near where we want to be with the vaccination. And I'm right. sure Nate will back me up on that. And with the new strain coming through, it does worry me a little bit to think that we have passed, you know, any landmark with getting back to normal. Just I my agree. thoughts. I agree with Sarah. I agree with Sarah in that um, it does seem like the cases are still too high and that with the new strain running, you know, its course now seems to be spreading um, and vaccine distribution not um, not happening quick enough. Um, I think it's best that we continue Zoom meetings for now and probably at least until the spring. We can reconsider, but uh, I would advocate for continuing Zoom. I know that other municipalities are still doing Zoom and even last year they continued doing Zoom even in the summertime uh, because it does allow, like Sarah said, it allows when properly advertised, it allows for people's participation and um, it eliminates that barrier of the fear of coming into a council meeting. And, um, and so from that perspective, and you know, I could see a hybrid model like Sarah suggested in, in the future, but I think, um, I think for now we should continue. Zoom. I would suggest that we go a month to month and on the decision okay. on that. Uh, yeah, we each time that. we get to this portion. Sorry, John, don't want to take your, <laughs> give you your agenda, but each time we reach this point in our, in our workshop uh, meetings, we can, we can throw discussion in if necessary. Um, it, it is difficult to get the, the vaccine. Um, hopefully they'll get that straightened out in the next month or so, and that may change things, but I, I would agree with both previous comments. I think we probably ought to, much to my chagrin, I, I think we should probably stick with it. My other, my other question too, is you said that um, you're suggesting that we go back to the regular office hours without appointments. Um, no, I was, no, 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 no. I wasn't suggesting that I was looking for, and this is where I was saying, I hope, I wish Nate was here to clarify what his outlook is looking like, but Sarah, Sarah uh, is getting as much, if not more information than what Nate's getting. So um, since he's changed jobs, but we are open by appointment only. Um, that means now we did this week, we started with all the ladies back in the office just to answer phone calls and keep things going. Um, the coordination on our end from everybody working at home at different places was getting a little more difficult, uh, especially when we're getting into the billing and getting into the, um, the, the audits coming up. So Glenda's not gonna be as available on the floor as what she usually is. So um, I think if- Roger, I, I would just add that as long as you can keep proper social distancing and you know, um, our company has a policy, the six foot office. Yep. And it is, if when the essential employees go in, they have to wear their masks whenever they're not at their desk and maintain social distancing at all times. Yep. Um, and you know, the borough is not gonna have this, but we have an app, like if an employee has to go in, we have an app that we have to check in on prior to coming into the office. Um, well, so we, have the, we have the thermometers and stuff and we're, you know, we, we keep an eye on things. And as soon as, as soon as I, I hear anything from any other department, I'm telling them they stay, they're, they're not to come in here at all unless they use the back door here and come directly into my office, so. I would hesitate though at opening up for public okay. uh, and keep it appointment only uh, so that you can properly screen people prior to coming in. Okay. That's, what I, that's what I was getting at. I was like, we can't very well say that we're gonna be continuing um, on Zoom and then have you guys put yourself at risk. Like I, so that's what I was right. getting at. Right. Yeah, I, didn't mean, I didn't mean to cut you off, Joe, I apologize. That's so, um, no, that's what I was looking for. Thank you. If that is the, the committee's wishes, we will continue with the way we are right now. I will have the ladies in here um, to, to take care of things and then we'll proceed from there. It looks like Chief Myers has her hand up. Yeah, I see that. That's okay. Are you going to unmute or are you just playing with your phone? I'm actually going to talk if I can figure out how to do that. Well, there you're you talking. Go. We're hearing um, you. They are doing 
hearings, preliminary hearings and hearings on traffic violations, citations at the district magistrate's office over Zoom. Um, so I think that with the county being closed, DJ's office isn't letting anybody in doing everything via Zoom. Um, unless, of course, there's a prisoner involved, but that's mostly by by Zoom. I think it's a good idea to keep keep that kind of thing where what, what we're doing, because um, from what I'm getting information wise, this spring is going to be no better, if not worse. Um, so I'm thinking that month to month is OK, but um, realistically, I was also told that even when you're vaccinated, you can still get COVID, same way as with the flu shot. So the vaccines are not going to be uh, the no all end all to everything either. So that is correct. The vaccine will just make you get it less. So you will not be having the symptoms quite as bad, but you can be a carrier. And what they're suggesting is that you are wearing a mask. Um, you know, if you don't have an N95 mask, that you're wearing a double mask, like a hospital mask and a cloth mask over top. Um, so it is important that people are wearing proper masks, keeping that social distance, because it is not going to fix it. It will definitely help it, and it will prevent you from getting a sick. So they are suggesting, you know, anyone over 65, anyone that has any lung issues, that those are the folks that really need to get it. Um, because it is a lower lung infection. So people who are prone to pneumonia, that they're the ones that will get hit the hardest when they get it. So you are absolutely right. And the Pronisary and the Orphan's Courts are all doing virtual um, hearings too. So uh, I, I think we're right on with everyone else. There's no question about keeping everything virtual and appointments. All right, Lisa, here, any other comments? I think we have pretty much a unanimous uh, thought process on that. So uh, I believe that's it for our Finance Administration and Ordinance Committee, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Anthony, appreciate that. Okay, first now I'm gonna to defer to Sarah. Sure, um, we, um, Rodney has not been feeling so well. So we are getting ready to have our first meeting um, I will follow up with him later on this week to see how he's feeling. Um, we do have to get our heads together so we can come back and talk to you guys about, you know, setting goals and um, being able to do reviews with um, borough staff. But we are just the very beginning process of it, and we will get together as soon as Rodney's feeling up to it. So I apologize. I know that we wanted to do it um, the end of last month, but we just weren't able to get together yet. Okay. Any questions for Sarah? Okay, moving on, um, property, parks, and recreation. That is also Mrs. Agerton. Um, so I don't have any updates other than we do have a massive meeting tomorrow night um, with a whole bunch of people. Thank you, John, and to Sarah for getting all of this scheduled. Um, we'll be working on the 100th anniversary and the community day planning that will be coming up in August. So. Um, that will be a Zoom meeting. It'll be the first, I'm sure, of many meetings to get things kicked off. And then we also, I sent out an, an invite. We will be scheduling a meeting in March, um, just waiting to hear back from everyone on the committee so that we can get that on the calendar. And I'll send out an invitation to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mrs. Agerton? Hearing none. That is uh, a public I'm that is sorry. A public meeting, right? That is a... So, yes, it was. Yes, it was advertised. It is a public meeting. So we should really be putting that link on the on the website and the um, Facebook page for people to join. If they to sign up to join. If they yeah, if they want to. Because that's the only way. I mean, that people can attend. So we have the option of attending. The other, I only had one other issue. One other um, item for that was the the list that the um, rec board made Correct. for park improvements. Could you, Roger? Could you forward that to us? Yes, I got to get that out to everybody. That was something that you asked about before, and I have not, and I have failed to get that out to everybody. 
Thank you. Yep. Uh, before we go off of that property, parks and recreation, I will, uh, I've reached out to a few different consulting firms about the safety precautions we may have to do to open the pool this year with COVID in effect the way it is. There were some, our insurance company is one of those that has a consulting consultant that will provide us with ideas of what we can do and what we need to do. Um, I think, and this is something that we're going to discuss at rec meeting next week, decide on, make a few decisions so that they can recommend to council action on uh, opening up to pool passes and uh, only uh, opening up to pool passes and walk-ins, uh, summer adventure camps, how we want to handle that situation and the concession stand. I think there's those four things are probably the biggest questions that we have hanging over um, the amount of people that are in the pool at one time. So uh, if we still have limits as to how many people can be allowed in there, I think we're going to have to make a decision. Do we do pool passes and residents or do we do summer adventure camp? Because there's times that we can have very many, many, many kids in there. And I think that's going to push us way over the limit with summer adventure camp. I don't, I still have to follow up with Tanya on how many she's looking at for summer adventure camp, but um, that could be a, a major problem uh, coming down the road. So just to keep that in everybody's heads, uh, next Tuesday when we meet with, when rec meets, we're gonna have that discussion. And to that point, I believe Hampton's already started selling pool passes. We have two, but oh, uh, we're optimistically selling them. Which means, <laughs> which means we're, I mean, we're, we're going to do everything we can to get that pool open. Okay. Uh, everything we can. Right, right Roger? <laughs> Even if, if we have to get creative. We, we've got it. We've got, we have to have some sunshine this summer. We sure do. We need a bottom and in sunshine. first. Yeah, so. we got to get the bottom in and get it painted oh, first, don't right? Ruin it. <laughs> we'll, we'll yeah. get, I promise you, we'll have a bottom in it, but just, just tomorrow's not the day. Well, the foot of snow in it right now. Before we move on, I, I did remember something else I wanted to ask, and that was the uh, natural playground. Uh, was everything completed with that, and did we fulfill all of our grant requirements? Our grant has been extended due to COVID for another 12 months, so we're in good shape with that. There is one thing outstanding yet, um, that is the bridge, and uh, we didn't put the classroom benches out yet. They're still... Um, they're still sitting over actually out at the sewer plant put together. They're just a matter of getting them out there and putting them in. Um, last couple months have been pretty tight, but we've got everything ready to go except for the bridge and that the bridge falls on me. Um, I designed it. I cut it out. It's up to me to put it together because I don't have the instructions written down on how to put it together. Okay. So we're in good shape though. Yeah. Yes. Right. Anything else for uh, Mrs. Agerton? Okay, moving on. Public Works and Safety, Mr. Pellman. Okay, uh, I think uh, both the topics that we'll discuss tonight will be things that uh, Roger suggested, which is the condition of the borough vehicles and the use of brine in our combating snowfall situations. Uh, so Rod, yeah. Okay, I can take it from there. Yeah, the the borough vehicles that we have, as far as at the, the highway garage, we took. Actually, we had um, yesterday. We had a, an overheating dump truck, one of the large ones. Uh, one of our mainline trucks went down. Uh, it also went down again today with no brakes in it. So we got it back. It still was running a little hot. So we know that there's something else wrong with it. Um, one of the other trucks that we're using, the mainline truck, has apparently never worked from the day we had it. I don't know why it was never returned. It was never given, you know, to adjusting or anything like that. But um, I gave instructions that once we get out of the spring, uh, into the spring here, and we're, we don't have to worry about snow anymore, I want those two trucks gone over. Um, they're very, they're the large trucks we have. They are our mainline trucks, and they need to be functioning. Um, at the full capacity when come time for snow plowing and, and uh, anything else we're using them for in the winter. 
Um, so those two are the big ones. The other ones are the small trucks. I did get a few prices. I didn't get all the prices I was looking for. Um, and I did not include them in the packets that went out. So I'm going to have to send those out. I will send those out with a, with a memo uh, for council. So we have them at the next meeting. I did talk to LB Smith Ford, uh, who is a CoStars dealer, uh, to get two replacement pickup trucks, one for the sewer plant, one for the borough office, or not the borough office, for the highway garage. Um, we have the one truck we took out of service um, last two weeks ago. We actually had to bring it back into service today to, to plow snow with. I don't like the fact that we're running an uninspected truck on the roads, but um, we didn't have a choice today. So the, uh, the other one is the sewer plant has, has a uh, truck that has the floors completely gone. It will not pass inspection. We took it out of service completely. Um, so they're down to one basic pickup truck for them to, to use for different utility stuff at the sewer plant. So I'm going to get an entire inventory of where we're at with our vehicles uh, to see where we're going. There's, we know coming up, there's a couple other trucks that are not going to pass inspection. Um, and we have another small dump truck that is not going to, this is the one that two years ago, the frame broke. Uh, we had it repaired and uh, there's other issues with it now that it just will not, it's not going to pass the next time we take it out for inspection. So we're going to be down two trucks basically um, here once the, once the snow is done and over with. And we're going to be looking at that. So I'm looking at I've also got uh, one of the assignments I gave the highway department, um, the public works department, uh, the new director was to start looking at what trucks he has, what trucks we can, we can keep running and then start a rotation plan. Um, this was started probably 10, 15 years ago and it kind of fell through. Um, there were some communication errors between personnel in this office and the highway garage. Um, that's, that's a personnel issue we can get into later, but um, the, the whole thing is there's a lot of stuff that we're finding out now that we did not know was the problem at the highway garage. So um, to the point that there's, there's some major problems out there um, and we're getting them worked on. One of them is the heat. The other one is the electrical panel that's on the, bar, on the, the agenda tonight. Um, so we're getting there. It's just, there's a lot of stuff coming to light as to where we're at. I'd really like to see a comprehensive vehicle replacement plan before we move forward with any sort of purchase on this front so that we know um, what needs replaced now and what needs replaced in the future and when. And um, yeah, that's, it's just I'd like to see some sort of plan put together. So I'm encouraged to hear that you asked them to, to look into that. Well, I'm also working on that too with the, the multi-purpose truck um, and looking at what we can do with that. Um, that kind of falls in line with the, with the brine uh, situation that kind of dovetails right into that section because I'm looking at a truck that, that we can use um, a flatbed. It has the leaf vacuum. Um, there's a few other situations things that we can use it for. Um, it depends on what we do, what cassette basically we put on the back of it. Um, there are many trucks out there that are available with this. And if you talk to the builders of the, the equipment, um, they can make any, just about anything fit on the back of this to the point. Um, I don't know if you've, you, you've probably all seen the green truck that we use with the, the bucket on it to put the Christmas trees up. Um, that truck, $3,400 this year to pass inspection. So there's the truck's not worth much more than maybe $8,000. So there's, uh, there's, there's coming a time coming, going to come a point in time where we're going to be nickel and diming ourselves and putting more money into these vehicles than that they're actually going to be worth at a trade-in. Um, the truck they put back in service today did not have that. So what I'd like to do is get a, a chassis, with the, the ability to use it on different things so that we're not, we don't have as many trucks. We just have different packages to put on the back of the truck to use it. Uh, one of the things I'm looking for is the, is the bucket to go on the back of that uh, as a package so that when they're doing Christmas trees 
or doing the, the Christmas decorations um, and they have to go out and pick up leaves. It's a matter of a couple minutes of changing from the, from the bucket truck to the, to the leaf vacuum and then they can be back out to work again. So um, with having a snow plow on the front of it and then also a flatbed with the brine system on it. Um, we did um, any questions, uh, let's, let's, any questions before I go into the second part of I that. I think there's merit in that, but have you looked into also, like we only need a bucket truck, like maybe one, one week out of the year. Um, maybe during that period of time, we could rent a truck for less than it would cost well, us to buy the piece of equipment. Actually, if I can interrupt, that's not actually true. No. Uh, yeah, we do use it for that. But I just was by the highway garage the other day. They were using the bucket truck to repair something on the roof. Um, if, if, I think we should have a bucket truck in our fleet because there's, there's, there's those occurrences when in an emergency situation, you don't have time to go rent a truck. And if it can be something that can be attached onto an existing vehicle that doesn't cost us a whole lot more money and it's easy for the guys to hook up if needed, I think it'd be wise to, to be able to cover that. Again, uh, uh, this comprehensive plan that, that you have these guys putting together should address that. Yep. And then we can discuss that later. Okay. Yeah, and I was also, I was reviewing the uh, vehicle list that you sent in October. Um, and it uh, says that we have nine trucks at the highway garage. Um, and we, and the, so our most recent purchases were two 2020 Fords, an F, mm -hmm. uh, F550 and an F350. Uh, the, the ones that you were referring to that, that need to be taken out, uh, which are those ones? Uh, have a, or like if you resend that list, would you be able to like put a note in as, as to the condition? Yeah, let me pull up what I sent you because I, I know which ones they are. I know them by truck number. That, that's um, fine. If you, if, if you provide uh, as part of your like uh, vehicle rotation, if you provide like a, a condition section too that we can review. That um, would scare you. <laughs> well, I mean, if, if you're saying that we need new trucks, I think it would be helpful to All right. as far as decision making goes and options. Okay, I can do that. I have a question too, and I'm not sure where it falls in between these two dots, but um, have we ever considered or priced now outsourcing snow removal? Not that I know of. No. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I'll put it this way. For the one night that we did it on Main Street for two trucks and the drivers, that was over $1,500. Yeah, it's pretty expensive for snow removal. I know that. Well, I don't know how that relates in cost to the cost of having our folks out there, the insurance that they carry versus the insurance that we have, the damages that happens or doesn't happen, the trucks that we may or may not be able to eliminate because we don't need to have snow plows on the front of them. I'm just asking the question. That's all. It's a good question. I, mean, I guess the other question is, you know, it would be possible to look at down the road in the future at some sort of you know, if, it, if we're outsourcing, also look at some sort of municipal agreement with a, with a neighbor to, to take on well, the, an area. The problem, the problem with that is we're going to be second fiddle. They're going to make sure their township's taken care of before they send anybody in town here. And that's a, I mean, this, this, is, this is something your residents are paying for. They're going to want, you know, I mean, we, could, we, were, we can be much more reactive if we have our own staff that take care of this. The other thing is, uh, over the years, while, while it seemed like a good thing to, to keep some of this old equipment on the road, it got to the point where, where it, it, it negated the ability to set up a plan mm -hmm. like we're looking at now so that we can keep a rotation, which is, is more cost effective to us as a, as a borough, and we get to give the services that our taxpayers are paying for. Yeah, just asking the questions. Yeah. So yeah. it's just ideas and, you know, um, providing the services that, that the residents pay for and the quality of service that they expect. 
which I think we're trying to do now <laughs> with, well, with, with patchwork equipment. They do a pretty <laughs> darn good job. You're right. And I think that goes into the, that actually goes into the second point too of, of dealing, of working something out with Monroe Township on the brine. Um, all we would have to do is, is, is have the brine, the applicator. Um, they have the machinery that would, would uh, generate the brine. They will sell it to us for 23 cents a gallon, um, which is actually the cost of the electricity to make it. Um, they're using, they're pumping it out of a well, they're mixing it with solar salt and um, they're using it to much success on their, I think they have three or four times the amount of roads that we have. Um, and they're putting it down three to four days ahead of time so that the stuff's not sticking as well. Um, even Monday morning, whenever uh, CH and Scott came in, uh, they drove up Allen Street here, the side that was sprayed a week ago still showed signs of not holding the ice as much as what the other side, uh, as what the side closest to the borough office did. So the stuff's effective even after a week um, and a rainstorm in there, I believe. So there's, there's an opportunity there. We can actually build the, the actual, all we have to buy is the tank um, and a pump. We can actually build it and plumb everything together. That is, there's also the opportunity out there that you can go out and purchase a, a vinyl tank um, with all the vinyl sprayers so you don't have to deal with corrosion. The thing should last forever as long as it's, you know, not um, backed into or something like that. But um, we can have one person on one truck take care of the whole borough instead of sitting around waiting for the, the snow to get to the point where they can spread salt on the roads. Um, because you spread salt on a dry road, it just bounces around, the cars brush it off. Where if you do the brine system, it's down, it's there, it sticks. Um, and like I said, unless it rains, it's going to be there whenever the snow comes. Um, the state's using it. Everyone around us is using it. Um, it's cutting down on the use of salt. It uses probably a, a quarter of the salt that we usually use. Um, I mean, we're, we're down quite a bit on our salt right now. Um, they've gone through in the last two snows, they've gone through almost 160 tons of salt. So we're pretty, we're hurting right now for salt. We've got to get some delivered. Would this, um, uh, would the brine, um, like, I know you said that they throw down salt, um, like before snow sometimes. I know, um, when, when you update us about snow removal, mm -hmm. um, would the, would spraying the brine during their regular working hours end up, uh, affecting the bottom line of our, the cost of snow removal at all? Or yes. How, what are the, well, like, would you be able to provide specifics about those numbers? <laughs> with, you're dealing with nature. It's hard to tell what, I mean, like this one, this snow here, they were sitting around most of the day waiting for enough snow to get out there to plow. Um, they were out salting, but there wasn't enough snow to actually to plow. They were, they were waiting for it to build up to the point that made it worthwhile to go out and plow off. The problem with it is when you put the salt down, you know, and you've got snow on the roads, then you go out a couple hours later and you're plowing the salt back off. So you got to give the salt time to work. So there's a, there's a variable in there. It's, it's going to cut our salt costs it's going to cut our manpower because we're not going to need you know seven trucks out there trying to cover the entire borough at one time we can do it with one truck and we can plan ahead when we hear the forecast they're calling for this stuff we can get the guy out there on the roads to take care of the stuff it's it's more of a pro planning than it is reactionary well and roger the, the other thing i wanted to with using less salt i would assume it's better for the environment too mm-hmm okay so uh, I know from my from my drive from Mechanicsburg to past the Holy Spirit Hospital, the roads that are brined, they're brined ahead of time and yep. they are much clearer. So, you know, I'm a big advocate for cutting down and we can use it. I think Joe's right. We can have these folks doing it during the regular work day, not paying so much money on overtime at night. I think it's going to save and it's probably going to save the equipment too from the plowing. Yeah. Well, it, play, it, it plays into that fact of, of you know, we're, we're planning ahead now. We're not just waiting and sitting, waiting on Mother Nature to decide when it's going to start snowing. Um, we can plan ahead, get this stuff done through the day. It cuts down on the overtime. It cuts down on the people sitting around just waiting for that, waiting to go out. Because we're paying them when they're sitting around waiting. Um, and we can, can we use beet juice eventually? 
<laughs> if you find Thank me a supply, <laughs> if you find me a supplier with beet juice, we'll use it uh, because it's much better on the environment than the salt is. <laughs> Perfect. I'll find you a beet farm. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any any other discussion on on that? Um. So with that in mind, uh, prior to calling the Borough Council meeting to order, I just want to review that the rules and procedures for the virtual meeting are posted on the website, and I believe in the waiting room for those who want to uh, attend these meetings. There are several things for guests, if we have any, uh, that I'd like to review very quickly. Public microphones will be unmuted to make comments during the public comment sections of the meeting on an individual basis. Uh, this will be done so the comments can be clearly heard by all. The public can use the raise your hand feature of the software and their microphone will be unmuted for them to comment. Members of the public must state their name and address before proceeding with their comment. And lastly, if a, com uh, a commenter would like to have their comments in the minutes unabridged, they must submit those to the borough office in writing. That being said, uh, I would like to call this borough council meeting of Mechanicsburg Borough, February 2nd, 2021 to order. We will begin with the uh, pledge to the flag. I happen to have my little flag here again. So it, it would be best if you all mute your uh, things temporarily because it never lines up quite right. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may unmute your mics. Roll call. Mrs. President Martin. Miller. I'm here. Vice President Miller. I'm here. Councilwoman Egerton. Here. Councilman Anthony. Here. Councilman Booker. Here. Councilman Palman. Here. Uh, Mayor Ritter, he's there. He's here. <laughs> Engineer Rogalski. Here. Chief Myers. Here. Chief Neff. Here. EMC Wardle. She on the next page. No, he's not here. No. Okay, thank you. Manager Sizerski. Here. And Assistant Manager Boyer. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. Mr. Szerski, are there any guests this evening? No, sir. There are no guests this evening. All right. Are there any citizen comments or requests? I'm not seeing any. So we will move on to correspondence. I have no correspondence, sir. Thank you. All right. We need uh, approval of the minutes of the regular uh, meeting of January 19th, 2021. Do I hear a motion? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Mrs. Agerton. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Mr. Miller. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Yes, I'd like to make a uh, uh, a change to the way that the minutes are written, please. And, and the, the bottom of page three, it says, Councilman Booker requested meeting minutes to be sent to, in a different format so he can alter them. Staff stated that he, uh, he, that that can be provided. I just think the word alter kind of is a, has a negative connotation. And it, I just asked if I could take notes. Uh, so I would appreciate if that's reflected in our minutes. Okay, did the PDF work for you? Yes, that was perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. I appreciate that. That is exactly what I was looking for. Okay. I think the, uh, I, would, I would change my second if the minutes are amended to reflect um, that Councilman Booker, his intent was not to to alter the the minutes, but to make notes on them. Be able to make virtually. notes virtually on his draft copy. Mrs. Ayrton, you amend your motion as well. <laughs> I, okay. I see the amend motion has been amended and properly seconded to reflect Mr. Booker's comments. Um, Unless they hear further discussion, we'll ask Mrs. Martin to call for the question. 
Unless I hear a negative response, I'll record the vote as unanimous. And the minutes are approved. Uh, engineer's report, Mr. Rogowski. Mr. President, the only item I have uh, this evening is later on related to the pool coding projects. So we'll have some discussion about that. All right, thank you very much. Um, and we move on to community liaison reports, downtown partnership, Mrs. Agerton. Okay, we continue to meet monthly. Um, we will be having a joint meeting tomorrow with the rec board and John Anthony and some members of the community for community day and the 100th anniversary of soldiers and sailors. Um, I do want to just say that, that the partnership continues to be creative and promoting um, our businesses downtown. So if you have an opportunity to check out their Facebook page, please like them and look at their posts. Um, I think they, they've been very effective at helping our downtown businesses and highlighting them. And that is my report. Thank you. Any questions for Mrs. Agerton? Uh, hearing none, we'll move on to the library. Mr. Pellman. Okay, well, uh, fundraising efforts at the library are as important as ever, especially in this age of COVID. So um, uh, nicely, uh, in the month of February, uh, the, the, uh, the Friends of the Mechanicsburg Library are hosting a, a dine-out, and this will be at Haas's on the Gettysburg Pike, Wednesday, February 10th, from 11 a.m. to 9 p.m., and up to 25% of your meal will go to Friends of the Mechanicsburg Library. And this is for dine-in or takeout. I think they, one of the reasons they're holding this is it's, uh, you know, we're back up to the uh, uh, higher capacity of people that are allowed to dine in now. Um, the Simpson Library is selling T-shirts in an effort to raise $40,000 this year. There's a logo on the front and a quote on the back of each of the t-shirts they have youth and adult sizes long sleeve or short sleeve and they range in price from 13 to 19 dollars you can purchase a t-shirt at the main desk order for one online or buy them at the book sales and speaking of book sales there is a february book sale saturday february 13th from nine to two and uh, the bag sale sunday february 14th from one to three and that's at their 114 North York Street uh, address. I've talked about three fundraisers real quickly. Uh, a different and unusual kind of happening at the library will be uh, held on Monday, February 8th. It's an uh, African safari from home. In this age of Zoom, this is a Zoom session. It's, like a, a, it's not a Zoom session. It's a live webinar, and it's presented by AAA Travel. And so you can register online for that, and see what uh, a safari in Africa is like from the comfort of your home. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Pellman? Uh, hearing none, we'll move on to Museum Association. Um, things are going <laughs> along the same with everything at the museum with regard to COVID and not being able to do any uh, public um, projects. However, I can update you that the gardens project uh, with the electricity is finally in. And so we now have heat in the little building and can turn the water on so that if we do have an event, we will have the ability to wash the dishes and have people use the bathroom if necessary. Um, the fence will be going in sometime in February, hopefully be done in early March. And uh, the Eagle Scout project will begin in, in uh, hopefully if the weather holds in March and the three gardens will be in, trees will be planted, uh, benches will be placed and we'll be button up, buttoning up the uh, project down there. So if you've been by to, to see it, it's looking good and we're real happy that we're gonna now finally get the use of that facility. Um, that's all I have at this time. Uh, so if no one has any questions, I'll turn the uh, program over to Rebecca Yerick. I believe you're here somewhere, Rebecca. I am. I'm. You uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Good evening, everyone. I want to uh, especially say hello to Solicitor Cassidy, who I am uh, more familiar with from another fine community. Welcome, Mike. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> um, we approved five about face grants for different businesses and properties in downtown. 
One of those includes a property that's been on our radar, radar for a number of years. That's 16 through 20 West Main Street includes Fantastic, Chef de Crepe, and the laundromat. The laundromat may be receiving um, a different grant specifically for their storefront. They've been wanting to do some different things here for quite a while. Sheila Frank Bridal opened at 50 West Main. So she returns to the unit she originally leased several years ago and is very happy to do so. Uh, someone already mentioned, I believe, the Larson Mead Works. Uh, Nate Larson has vacated that space and it will be available next week. I have contacted some particular business types of businesses who might be interested and I'm going to do a broader um, post to let people know that that is available. Um, someone had mentioned the possibility of a distillery. They could not have a distillery working, still works there because there are residential units in that building. And that's a no, no, can't do that. 400 West Main Street is green, where Green and Walt accountants were. That building is under contract and will settle by the end of February. And lastly, um, borough manager Sisersky contacted me earlier this week to see what I knew about the light posts in the Strawberry Alley Municipal Parking Lot. And this goes back about seven years, but you may recall that we had those light posts uh, painted and then banners hung on Main and Market Street at 48 different locations. Those are the downtown banners that speak to our history and our specialty shops and so forth. I have a little over $3,000 left from those original grants. The, the last one is from the Mechanicsburg Club and I would be more than pleased to contribute that to an effort to replace the two downed street light posts in the parking lot at Strawberry Alley. Uh, the remaining funds were expressly for maintenance. So that's a perfect fit and would be able to utilize those funds um, available right now. So I'll be looking into that. And that's everything that I have. Business is brisk. Anything for me? Thank you for looking into that, Rebecca. That was one of my questions yep. to the borough manager. And it would be nice to see them replaced and not used as trash cans. <laughs> so, um, my question for you, Rebecca, is can we steer the distillery towards the uh, bag processing facility? What's, uh, what's the name of that? Lumbies? Yeah, oh, Lumbies. Yeah. I got word that may be under contract for someone else. Yep. Um, I I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm working with a bunch of brewers right now, a couple distilleries oh, no. and, and several wineries, and they're all across the, the board. Some of them will make things happen and others will evaporate. <laughs> understand. They, it's a changing uh, industry. Rebecca, to that question, what happened to Larson's? Did he move or did he just simply close? <laughs> uh, it was um, a multifaceted departure. Hmm. It was it was not COVID related. Okay, it's too bad. He will be missed. Yeah, he'll be mm -hmm. missed. Anything else for Rebecca? Uh, on behalf of council, thanks again for all you do for us. We appreciate it. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Um, moving on, are there any additions to the agenda? I have two, and I'm going to defer the one to Mr. Cassidy, uh, Solicitor Cassidy. Uh, the executive session on a matter of personnel with potential action can be removed from the agenda. Um, Solicitor Miller felt that next the next council meeting would be a better time to discuss that. Okay. And the other one concerns the first item on the agenda and solicitor, I'll let you take it from there. Uh, certainly. Uh, so in uh, reviewing the, uh, the, the process that borough has engaged in thus far with respect to the codification of ordinances, 
Um, and during the transition with uh, my predecessor, Lisa Coyne, um, I think there may have been some mixed um, or cross signals rather in terms of, of the status um, that the, the borough was at with respect to the codification. Um, very briefly, the borough code has a, a rather quirky procedure that must be followed when enacting an ordinance which recodifies the ordinances. Um, and the process is that the, the ordinance must be formally introduced to council and the rest of the public at a public meeting 30 days prior to enactment. And then 15, not less than 15 days prior to enactment, the borough is required to publish a notice of introduction uh, in the newspaper, somewhat similar to how you uh, advertise other ordinances. In this case, the, the, the codification ordinance, um, that is ordinance number 1170, has not been formally introduced at a council meeting. So my suggestion is that we use tonight's meeting as the formal introduction. The, um, and then I would request that council uh, direct the borough manager and myself to publish a notice of introduction in accordance with the borough code uh, in anticipation of council taking formal action at its March 16th meeting um, to approve that ordinance. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, regarding that, that procedure. Okay, so <laughs> my, my question is uh, just as a matter of, of uh, process, we would add that information to the item that's already on the agenda, correct? Correct. Yeah. So, so I, would su I would suggest amending the first uh, agenda action item uh, to essentially read um, a formal introduction of ordinance 1170 for the recodification of the borough ordinances and then discussion and consideration by council to direct the borough manager and solicitor to advertise the notice of introduction in accordance with uh, section 3301.5 of the borough code. And if you need me to send that via email, Roger, I, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, please do that. Can I, I'm, I got 3301.5 borough code, and that's all I've got written down right now. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, memory Mr. lesson. <laughs> I'll make them. I'll make the motion. If that makes any difference. All right. Actually, Kyle, right. I have a copy of that motion because the solicitor reached out to me as chair of the committee, and so I can read it when it's officially required. If that's what the president would like. That's correct. All right, so we will just uh, add that as an approval of an addition to the agenda. So Mr. Miller has, am I correct, has made the motion and Mr. Anthony has seconded it. Unless I uh, go to Sarah to that. Unless I hear a negative response, I will record the vote as unanimous. And we will add that to the agenda first item. Okay. All right. So now we need to make a motion to approve the agenda. There, you didn't have anything else. Is that correct, Roger? That's correct. Okay. So we need a motion to approve the agenda now with the amendment. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Mr. Pellman. Is there a second? Second. Wow. I got three seconds. Uh, we'll give that one to Mr. Anthony. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Martin. Unless I hear a negative response, I will record the vote as unanimous. And the agenda is approved. Action items before Borough Council. Mr. Cesarski. I will defer to Councilman Anthony to read this since he has it already in an email. Formal introduction of proposed ordinance 1170 recodifying the Borough Council Borough's Code of Ordinances and discussion and possible action directing the Borough Manager and Solicitor to advertise a notice of introduction in accordance with section 3301.5 of the Borough Code. I'll second Mr. Anthony's motion. 
There we go. So Mr. Anthony makes the motion. Mr. Miller seconds. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Martin? Unless I hear a negative response, I'll record the vote as unanimous. And the motion carries. Thank you very much. Yep. Next item, please. Discussion and possible action to award the bid for the pool coating project. Do I hear a motion? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Mrs. Agerton. A second? I'll second that. I'll second. That was Mr. Booker who got in ahead of you there, Mr. Pellman. Uh, okay, is there any discussion? Mr. President, if I may give a little background. Yep, please. Um, so as council may be aware, you know, I think it was late last year, we discussed the potential of, uh, you know, uh, putting an epoxy pool paint coating on the pool, which is a step up from what we do kind of normally here on a year on an annual basis. So we did bid the project. Um, and uh, fortunately, RJR Engineering is also the same firm that is doing the current pool work. So that uh, makes coordination and kind of, you know, putting it under one shop easy for us. Um, we did also bid it in two pieces, if you will, a base bid, which is um, the two pools that we're currently doing work on, which is the main pool and the waiting pool. And then we also bid an ad alternate for the competition pool. So if you were to choose to just go with the base bid, um, that came in at $57,500 uh, for those two pools that we're doing work on currently. Or uh, you can also choose to uh, award both the base bid and the alternate um, and the alternate was an additional $22,350 um, for a grand total of $79,850 if you so choose to do that direction. So I would recommend that um, any motion that's made would include the decision on the uh, alternate. Just a uh, quick question as to why the bids are so stunning. Yes, yeah, so um, you know, we... I think we had two two players out there that um, just kind of threw some numbers at it with the hope that they would get the bid. Um, I was, you know, offline told from RJR that they were very aggressively pursuing um, that particular uh, project simply because they're out here, they're already here. Um, and then also that they, the, the numbers that they had provided, if you recall, as a change order to their current contract just for budgeting, were more in line with those numbers that they provided in the bid as opposed to the, you know, 160 five thousand uh, dollar range so um also those two firms are um they're subs of subs of subs so they're they're basically general contractors that use other labor rjr uses their own labor so that's the best i can offer um at this point uh, i have a question in regards to the the coding itself um I, I if i remember correctly from the previous uh bid tabulations um if we add this coding to the surface we have to get a pool cover is that correct no. So we had discussed previously the potential of plastering the pool, and that is what oh, required okay. the pool cover. This we will still be, and I, I was remiss in, in mentioning that we are removing all the existing coatings. So there's like four or five coats of, you know, various paint buildup over the years that we will be taken off down to clean concrete. Um, we will have to do some repairs, which will be additional to this. So we sh it's prudent to budget some additional monies uh, with the joints and some other things. Um, and um, you know, then we'll recoat uh, the, the pool uh, or pools as the case may be. Okay, um, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? What is the uh, manager's recommendation in terms of what fits within our budget? Our, our JR's bid. Uh, and I think that would have to be included in the the motion along with uh, whether or not to go with the um, Yeah, I was going to ask you, yeah. you also recommended the, the option, the alternate. Yeah, I, I think what we're, the Olympic pool is probably one of the quicker ones to paint. It doesn't use the special, what they call saucy paint, saucy paint or whatever it's called. It's the stuff that has a real rubber based coating to it. And it really, um, <sighs> It's not that bad. The the other one, the, the, the large pool and the kitty pool, they both are, are pretty bad as far as getting the paint. If it doesn't dry completely, it gets on bathing suits. We get a lot of complaints, complaints about it. The prices that are on there are probably six to seven years worth of painting of the pool. And if that, that has a lifespan, Greg, I think that we said at one time almost 10 years. Yeah, they, they quote seven to 10 and it's, you know, obviously based on a lot of factors, but you, you could, 
very well break even, you know, with, with just painting it every year. Correct. And that's, that's, this, that's based on last on 2019 year prices. Another issue too, is with the buildup of paint that's on there now, eventually as you paint, say you painted seven more years of the current, you know, the current coating, you're going to have problems with it adhering um, yep. as you go down the road. And it's just, you know, eventually you're going to have to kind of bite the bullet here and, you know, blast that everything off and clean it up any way around. So, so is the motion to include the, the Olympic pool or not to include the Olympic pool? I think that needs clarified, Mr. President. It does need to be clarified, Mr. President. So it's, it's RJR is the lowest um, responsible bidder, both based upon the base bid and the base bid with the alternate. And so the discussion item for council, I think is two part, is whether or not to move forward with the, the project based on the base bid and whether or not the alternate should be added in. Thank you. And the reason I brought it up is um, my, my feeling about it personally is if you have the people there, it'll probably be a lot less expensive to do that now than if we were to put it off a year or two or three, it probably triple in price to come in just to do that one pool when they're already there. I don't know, Greg, can you speak to that? You're absolutely correct. So, you know, obviously uh, a lot of what we carry in a contract just to have a contract, bonds, insurance, mobilization, all that stuff, you know, has a cost to it. So as you mentioned, Gary, like, you know, if you did it by itself, um, it would be, I don't know about three times, but it would certainly, it could be double, I would think, um, for sure. Uh, and um, I think that, you know, for the cost benefit component of it, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it now, or you're not going to do it at all for seven years. So I would amend my motion to include that we would accept the bid from RJR with the alternative with the Olympic pool. Is that correct? Okay. Okay. For a total bid of $79,850. Right. And right. I think Joe, you seconded that. Am I correct? Yeah, I'll, I'll still second that. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Martin. Unless I hear a negative response, I will record the vote as unanimous. And the motion carries. Next item, please. Discussion of possible action to authorize replacement of a federal panel box at the highway department. I believe I included two bids in your packets. Uh, I was expecting a third one. We did not get one in, um, in time to get it out to you. Um, the, the two bids are not that far off um, as far as the base work goes. There is one that has an addition to it, um, and we have not received the third bid yet. I will defer to council on what they want to do with this. Okay, well, let, let's see if we can get a motion first, and then we'll have some discussion. Do we hear a motion? Then I'll, I'll talk make to a council. motion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pellman. Is there a Second. Second. Was that you, John? Did you watch? Thank you. Okay, so it's been properly moved and seconded. And now it's discussion. Um, I have a question, actually, um, and you've kind of touched on a little bit, Roger. The two bids. The one includes. It mentions another panel or something. Is that included in in the Ruth bid too, or I, I'm confused why one shows that and one do, the other doesn't. No, it does not. It, it, because it was found when the first guy was there to give his bid, there was stuff in front of the second panel box, which is actually constructed of wood. Um, and then when they moved the stuff away from there, when they're in their process of cleaning up before the second guy came to, to, to give his bid, that's when they found that second panel box, um, which is actually, it's, it's quite frightening. Some of the stuff that we're finding at, at the highway garage. This this panel box is made out of wood. The the guy said he wasn't he didn't he wasn't worried about coming back. He would look at it when he got there and give us a price. Then uh, we tried to tell him that's not how it works. But um, I'm still waiting on a third third bid on this. But yeah. with the numbers as low as what they are, this is a this is a safety issue. Um, I'm sure everybody is aware of Kramer's uh, brothers glass. This was similar to the situation they had down there. Yeah, I, I get all that. What I don't get is, is the roof bid going to address that wooden box too or not? 
No. The first one, no. Well, then it seems like we have to get we have proper, we have to get the proper quote then from yeah, that's my all point. the people all the people that bid. Correct, and I'm like I said, I'm missing a third quote also. And my question for Mr. Cassidy is: Do we have to receive three quotes, or only go out for three? Only ask for three quotes. Uh, the, the borough is required to uh, solicit three telephonic quotes. And um, if, if the borough is unable to uh, secure three quotes, we simply need to have a memorandum kept in the file as to the efforts to solicit the three quotes. And, and to be clear, there's no re uh, requirement under the uh, borough code to award this contract the lowest quote. Um, it's a little different than competitive bidding. Uh, there may be reasons why you go with a higher quote for whatever reason, but um, from a from a practical standpoint, a fiduciary duty standpoint, as long as you're comparing apples to apples, it usually makes fiduciary sense to award it to the lowest quote. So I guess we have two options. One is we can table it and wait for an apples to apples comparison, or if the situation is so dire, you know, we could award it to the person who had quoted us for both being responsible, we don't know what the other one is going to come in at. So we couldn't really award it for something. We don't know what the cost will be. So Roger, is, is your, would your, were we to do this, would your plan be to contact um, JL Ruth to give a quote on the other box as well? So we do have an apples to apples comparison. Yeah, I think that's the best thing to do. Yep. All right. Can, yes. can we do that in, with some expediency so that we can address this at our next meeting and get this moving? We will do that, yeah. And I'll, start, I'll see if I can get the third guy to give his, his quote in here and at least get in and take a look at it, okay. even if he doesn't want to bid on it. I'll make a motion to table. Okay, it's been a motion to table. Um, we don't need a second um, on that. Um, I believe we do still have to vote on it though, right? So Correct. Mrs. Agerton. Yeah. Oh. Or I mean, sorry, Mrs. Martin. Uh, unless I hear a negative response, I will record the vote as unanimous. Thank you. I got my Sarah's mixed up there. Sorry. Okay. So we will uh, get that information out and move as quickly as we can to remedy this issue. Okay. Um, okay. Um, next item, please. Discussion of possible action on the service agreement with the Redevelopment Authority for the County of Cumberland for the downtown services program services manager. All right, do I hear a motion? I'll make the motion. Make Thank you, motion. Mr. Miller. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Mrs. Agerton. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Martin? Unless I hear a negative response, I'll record the vote as unanimous. Thank you. Next item, please. Discussion of possible action to approve expenditures from all funds for the period beginning January 1st, 2021 through January 31st, 2021. For the fire fund, $22,646. The general fund, $143,934.46. The highway fund, $11,976.14. The pool fund, $515.16 and zero from the capital fund. Okay, do we have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. And uh, we need a second. A second. Thank you, Mrs. Agerton. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mrs. Martin? Unless I hear a negative response, I'll record the vote as unanimous. And the motion carries and the bills are paid. Thank you. Uh, it's this time in our meeting where we open the floor for citizens comments. Are there any comments? Uh, seeing none and hearing none. Is there any other business? We'll start with Glenda. No, sir. Thank you. Roger? Uh, no, sir. Just everybody try to stay warm and <laughs> keep your heads down for the snow. That's stupid groundhog. Thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, Mrs. Agerton. Um, just a reminder to everyone, it is February, it is Black History Month. 
Um, so, you know, just remember that as we go through February to honor um, a lot of our figures that may not have been mentioned in our history textbooks and to um, participate actively in honoring them. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. Nothing, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Booker. I just, again, I'd like to uh, echo my uh, uh, appreciation to the highway department uh, with their clearing of the roads after this uh, snow this past weekend. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Nothing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pellman. I have nothing. Thank you. Um, Solicitor Cassidy. Uh, nothing, sir. Thank you. Chief Neff. Nothing, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chief Myers. Nothing, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Ritter. Nothing, sir. Thank you. Am I getting through? You are. Oh, my golly. I'm <laughs> Great to hear your voice. On Windows 10. Oh, I get to be such a big boy. <laughs> I didn't have to see me. You're a technological wizard, Mr. Oh, Mayor. Oh, okay, we're busy opening up sidewalks and salting sidewalks downtown. And uh, uh, by the way, uh, Holy Spirit had uh, COVID shots last week. So uh, just call in and go get one. So it's, Holy Spirit does have the vaccine. End of report. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Rogalski? Thanks, sir. Thank you. Did I miss anyone? Mrs. Martin? <laughs> Uh, if you you should be getting your ethics forms in the mail. Please return them. Thank yes, you. I got mine today. Thank you. And I'm I'm pleased to say I was able to get my first uh, COVID vaccine shot. I had to go to Lewistown Hospital to get mine. At the time, we we uh, tried to go everywhere in Cumberland County. There wasn't any place that we could get one, and we found a number and got one. Got ours up there. And I might I might add a little a little humor to this to not to uh, at all diminish the seriousness of the, of the virus, but um, I went through a, a Chick-fil-A drive-through the other day. And I said to the, the person, ironically, because this came up in the news this morning, uh, ironically said to the person giving the food out, I said, you know, you guys should run this vaccine distribution because you do such a great job of great. getting Oh, tons short. of cars through in no time flat and you know whose car i'm in i mean you know my name before i even drive up there so here we go on the news this morning uh, a county somewhere in michigan or minnesota or somewhere <laughs> hired the local manager of the chick-fil-a to oh. help them uh, coordinate the effort <laughs> to give the shots so i think that's kind of humorous but uh it is difficult to find places to get them hopefully that's going to turn around soon um so i get to go back to lewistown again on february the 20th to get number two and i'm really anxious to do that so uh, uh and, and i'll i'll do an, an addendum since we don't have nature um they did update the pa website today to get the vaccine they um reached their algorithm so you should be getting a more accurate picture of who has the vaccine shot for you very good so unless I hear anything else, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you everyone for helping out tonight. Good meeting. And we hope everybody stays happy and healthy and we'll see you in a couple of weeks.